Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and I want to thank our underwriter, Audiobooks.com. Audiobooks.com is a wonderful site where they have a full catalog of all the books you're looking for, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. Our book today is Supermind, How to Boost Performance and Live a Richer and Happier Life Through Transcendental Meditation. I'm honored to have with us today Dr. Norman Rosenthal, MD. He is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University School of Medicine. He conducted research at the National Institute of Mental Health as a research fellow, a researcher, and a senior researcher for more than 20 years, and was the first psychiatrist to describe and diagnose, you've heard of this, seasonal affective disorder known as SAD. Rosenthal is a highly cited researcher uh, and author of more than 200 academic articles as well as books for the general public. You may have heard of Winter Blues and The Emotional Revolution. But today we're talking to him about his newest book called Supermind on Transcendental Meditation. Dr. Rosenthal, welcome. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing just great. No seasonal, no seasonal affective disorder. Well, you know, honestly, the weather's been pretty rotten here in the mid-Atlantic region, so... Mm-hmm. A lot of my patients are complaining, and uh, I'm having to have them get their light boxes back out again. <laughs> they thought they'd pack them away for the season. When I uh, years ago, I, I lived in Oregon for a brief time, and uh, they called it paradise in the rain. And uh, <laughs> and when I was there, I remember hearing about uh, some version of seasonal affective disorder, but they didn't have it named. You might say. And I remember uh, in Portland that they had people who would get depressed during these long, cloudy winters in Oregon, uh, sitting in front of banks of light, uh, ultraviolet mm, yes. l- l- light, I believe, right? And uh, uh, regular light, mm-hmm. just regular, just regular light. light. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, do you use anything like that? I do. I, I use it myself, and I re- recommend it to my patients who have trouble with the darkness. Mm-hmm. But right down there where you are, I don't think that's probably <laughs> no. <the> problem. <laughs> no, we always have the opposite problem. Somebody, somebody dim the sun for God's sakes. <laughs> the I think we have here, but we're not like you know we're not Arizona with three hundred and thirty sunny days a year, but we're probably three hundred. We're probably fairly close to that. I wanted to um, launch right into transcendental meditation. Uh, I wanted, I mean, I might be. Perhaps I was raised too much of a redneck, but uh, I never really got into uh, transcendental meditation. Never really bought it, you might say, because I always thought of it as kind of a hippieish thing, as something that was done by uh, people who were, you know, very different from me. I'll put it that way. And uh, but recently, I wanted to take a look at it again because I read that. Uh, uh, Seinfeld, at the age of, I guess, Seinfeld's about 56 now or something like that. I think he's, six, he's actually 60. Is he? And, um, yeah. And uh, he had read, I mean, excuse me, um, he had uh, decided to try it after a long, long period of, of ignoring it and uh, found that he was connected to uh, a kind of creativity that uh, he never had experienced before. And so I wanted you to, um, you know, speak to that, to the people who are transcendental meditation agnostics. Uh, what do you say to them? Well, I, I like agnosticism because it leaves an openness, you know. It means you're open. You're not mm-hmm. a complete atheist. Uh, I would say to them <clears throat> that I've been a psychiatrist for 37 years, uh, treating patients all this time, that I have been a researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health for 20 years and described, as you mentioned, seasonal affective disorder. Um, and so I've run a clinical trials uh, organization using medications for 10 years. So I would say I've been around the block a couple of times. 
Yes. And of the interventions or of the processes that I've come across, transcendental meditation is one of the most powerful, effective ways of changing oneself in a good way that I've ever come across. Would and you, I've said that if, if you could put it in a capsule, it would be a multi-billion dollar blockbuster. <laughs> well, you yourself were a, a, a practitioner of TM when you were younger, and then you let it slide for a while and came back to it, right? Yeah, I, I did it in those hippie times, you know, with flower power and <laughs> make love, not war. And that sort of thing. And, and it was kind of a fad of my youth. I didn't take it seriously, you know. I thought my TM teacher was a ditz, but she was very pretty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I was actually, I was young and busy. I was a medical student. It was just one of the things I did and let go. Mm. But even then, it kind of interested me. But I just, you know, you are so busy when you're young, you don't have time for lots of things or you think you don't you know in retrospect i think it would be, it'd be nice if i'd continued but i didn't mm -hmm. 35 years later a patient is in my office and directing me to look into it because it's been so helpful to him a very sensible guy mm -hmm. and eventually i did i got my technique refreshed i started meditating regularly and then i felt these changes good changes coming over me at first during the meditation, but afterwards in my everyday life. And uh, so many good things begin to happen to me that I began to examine it and see it happen in several of my patients to whom I had recommended it. And uh, then I did a research study. I took, uh, made a questionnaire with the help of colleagues, and I administered it on SurveyMonkey to over 600 people and analyzed the data. And sure enough, over time, as you meditate, consciousness grows and all kinds of gifts follow. Mm -hmm. And so now mm -hmm. I'm very persuaded of these benefits. I know they might sound strange because they would have sounded strange to me, but I've never worried about that. You know, when I first came up with seasonal affective disorder, people laughed at me, many of them. Mm -hmm. Colleagues teased me. Uh -huh. at, a, at a meeting, I remember one colleague, a woman, saying, come on, let's stand here in front of the lights. I'm feeling depressed already. <laughs> so they kind of teased me. But, you know, I knew I was onto something. Mm -hmm. And indeed, now millions of people have it. There are industries of light companies that have sprung up around the thing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I didn't have stock in any of them. <laughs> um, but, uh, y y you know, and now, at the, by the same token, I am so convinced that this expansion of consciousness is real, that I'm absolutely staking my reputation on this idea and on this book, uh, because I think so many people can gain so, uh, you know, so what if I look like a fool? Mm -hmm. I don't care. As long as people benefit, that's all that actually matters. Well, I have no doubt that it benefits some people. I mean, when you look at the list of people that you cover in your book, like Hugh Jackman and a lot of other uh, artistic types, uh, of course, famously uh, John Lennon, one of the most creative people of the century, um, believed very much in transcendental meditation and what it had done for him. I have no doubt that it's helpful to some people. Uh, but when I myself have given it a shot, I cannot silence the echo chamber of, uh, kind of like Ellen DeGeneres said, I can't silence the uh, little advertising jingles that bounce around in my head. I can't get to wherever I think brighter people, <laughs> you know, uh, seem well, to be able to get to. When you say you gave it a shot, I'm curious what that actually consisted of. Oh, it was just did you uh, actually go and do the did you go and do the course? No, 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 no. Did you learn? No, I simply read about it and I had a friend who was who had been to India and he did it and he told me how to do it mostly just to, you know, to find a quiet place and try to, you know, concentrate your mind and empty it of everything and so uh, I will admit, you know, I didn't stick at this for a very long time. I just tried it two or three times and following his instructions, and I was never able to silence my mind 
And I just thought, well, maybe it's just something some people can do, and I, and I can't. Well, and I, I really, really want to question that, because let's say I'm, I say, well, I'll teach you how to blow the flute. Uh, blow in one end, and then <laughs> just move your fingers up and down the holes on the top, and music will come out. Uh-huh. Um, and then you give it a shot, and you find these nasty sounds coming out. And say, well, I gave it a shot. I really think if you really want to give it a proper shot, um, let me help you connect with a real teacher and mm-hmm. give it a real shot, and then let's talk again. Because obviously you have an open mind, and you're curious, and you're interested. But I think you don't do yourself a service when you sort of get it on the side from a friend Mm-hmm. It's just not the same as when you're properly taught. I know it seems so simple. Why can't I just have somebody tell me? Why should I have to go to the center? Why should I have to you know, pay whatever it costs, mm-hmm. to deal with the teacher, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But really, it, it, they know what they're doing, these guys. They've done it for a long time. And mm-hmm. even now, you know, if my meditation becomes less effective or whatever, I check in with the teachers, they take me through the stages, and mm. wow, I'm back on track okay. again. So if you really want to give it a shot, that's what I suggest. What I well, how is meditation different from prayer? Very different. Well, firstly, there are different kinds of meditations. We can get to that separately. But when you pray, when you, when you, pray you petition someone. Please, God, let me, you know, let me, whatever, you know, I pray to you, whoever the you might be, whichever religion you you have, you are asking for something, you are thanking some object, you're thanking someone, um, you're promising to do something. There's another entity out there with whom you're having some kind of inner dialogue. When you meditate, you're just with yourself. There's no necessarily no something else. You're just, you're accessing an aspect of yourself. You're growing an aspect of yourself. And that's the difference. What is a super mind? Excuse me. A super mind is the mind at its maximum uh, development, at its maximum effectiveness, performance, creativity, function. But it's also... Uh, a mind where you're enjoying your experience, where where daily life feels rich and good and full. So it's not only how well you do, it's also how you feel about it. And so that's what the supermind is, and the book is all about how this particular technique, by growing your consciousness, can indirectly give you a lot of things that you probably want, uh, rather than going at them directly, which is sometimes not always successful. When you did this massive survey that you did, what did you find were the um, rather consistent benefits for people who invested heavily in uh, transcendental meditation? Well, I'll actually just read down some of the uh, chapter headings in the section called Gifts of the Supermind, because that's the distillate of my questionnaire results. Uh, Connecting body and mind, feeling uh, healthier, feeling Uh, better internally, making healthier choices in your life, Uh, building a better brain, uh, being more uh, functional, focused, better memory, being in the zone. There's a wonderful piece about a friend of mine, Barry Zito, former all-star pitcher for the San Francisco Giants, who got into the zone in a crucial game in the playoffs. Uh, which was pivotal in helping them to win the World Series, but being in the zone... That's an impressive story. Yes, it was It was a great story, and uh, he credits TM with, with helping him to do that. Um, internal growth, um, Hugh Jackman saying that it's helped him become his authentic self, which he puts right up there with uh, marriage and family as one of the best life decisions he's made to do TM. Um, But then, you know, as you grow, sometimes, even though you may access who you really are, you may say, well, who do I want to become? How do I become better as a person or better in this or that way? It'll help you to do that. Um, Engagement and detachment. You know, when Freud said the goals of, of life, it's to work and to love. And that's what we learned when we were 
training to become psychiatrists? How do we get better relationships? How do we do well in our work? But what if the relationship's a bad one? Mm -hmm. What if the career you've chosen isn't a good one? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to know how to detach. You know, you have to know when to hold them and when to pull them. <laughs> yes. How, how, how do you do that? And how do you do that graciously? And how do you deal with the loss? Because even if you're making a change, you're still having to say goodbye to things that you're familiar with. So that comes through with the uh, supermind. Then there's this curious thing that they've called support of nature. People will say, you know, I've become luckier. People have become nicer to me. Things have gone my way more. Now, I don't believe that there's some mysterious force out there that's designing the universe to make life happier for you. I think as we become nicer and, and more effective, things actually happen more easily. I know, for example, since I've started meditating, I have written four books and revised uh, one book. So mm -hmm. that's only eight years. And I never had that level of productivity in the decade that preceded that. Um, so, uh, you know, things go easier. And then the last two chapters in the section will be lightning rods to your listeners. The one is meditate and grow rich, and the mm. other is meditate and be happy. Mm. Two things that a lot of us want. Uh, they, they are, and the survey shows that people actually feel like certainly happiness is a huge deal. Wealth, not as much as that. I mean, over 50% say they've become wealthier. It's not such a huge number, but when you talk about well-being or uh, feelings of happiness, more than 90% say that that has been more so since they started meditating. So all these gifts are yours simply by delving into yourself. Well, I think that uh, you've you've had a practice a long time. You no doubt have run into uh, many people who are wealthy but unhappy, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Wealth is no uh, assurance of happiness. Absolutely not. But you know what I'm finding is that a lot of wealthy people are becoming intelligent about that, and they're mm -hmm. doing things that make them happier, like they're being more philanthropic, mm -hmm. they're caring about other people more, uh, and they are investing in uh, connecting with people and that you know many wealthy people are now doing transcendental meditation i mean a lot of people are understanding uh you know i'm talking with these extremely successful people because they understand that they need to add i would say a spiritual dimension to their life it's, it's different from religious mm -hmm. it's sort of accepting that there's a part of our being that it may not be formally religious, but it, it transcends ordinary, everyday stuff. You know, maybe we need to do a little more giving. Maybe we need to be mm -hmm. a little kind. That side of the self, they realize that that's important. It's not just about how many people can you beat at uh, business and how many people can you <laughs> knock off the map in order to become uh, the big the, the big enchilada <laughs> if, if uh, you could can since you deal a lot with I'm sure people struggling to find happiness or what they call happiness what would you say are some of the uh, central elements of a happy person well I'm so glad you asked because it just so happens that I have an actual list a happiness list and here it is 11 points one, understand that having more money may not lead to lasting happiness. Two, take control of your time. Uh, slavery, of time slavery, where somebody owns all your time, is not a happy state. Three, smile. Evidence shows that acting happy can make you so. Four, find work and activities that you're good at and are meaningful to you. Five, invest in shared experiences such as vacations, rather than just things. Six, stay active. Exercise boosts mood. Seven, get enough sleep. Eight, cultivate and nurture close relationships. Nine, do good. It makes you feel good. Ten, embrace gratitude, both in your thoughts and actions. 
keep a gratitude journal and express gratitude when you feel it. Mm. And 11, nurture the spiritual side of yourself. And, of course, this book deals with number 11. What a magnificent list. That is wonderful. Glad you like it. It's on page 196 for easy reference. <laughs> the... Uh, one of the things I wanted to, to mention uh, is that in, in the list is the notion, uh, well, not necessarily the notion, but the kind of advice or implied advice to strengthen your uh, relationships, uh, to be more connected. And it's an irony that in this world of, of the most interconnected medium we've ever had, we are less connected than ever. Yes, I know. For example, I had to log in the de- other day uh, to Facebook and I couldn't. Uh, remember my password <laughs> and, and it said well here identify some of your Facebook friends and we'll let you in and I thought I can't identify them I, mm-hmm. I don't really you know they're not actually I remember a cartoon it's the undertaker and his friend are standing at the back of the empty funeral hall and the coffin is at the front and the undertaker says you know Frankly, I'm disappointed at the turnout. After all, he does have a thousand Facebook friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Was well, so another along while we're talking about the internet. Another thing that I've thought of recently that and another reason I was interested in your book is because I've noticed something that that I call uh, acute internet Alzheimer's which is that I can't focus very long. I, I'll say, okay, I need to go look up this on Google, and I just go over to Google, and by the time I get there, 2.3 seconds later, I can't remember what it was I wanted to look up. And uh, I don't think I'm and, unique and in then, this. And then if you're anything like me, you say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. I'll just Google something else instead. <laughs> I'll just go I, in I'm a here. new direction. I'm here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll come back to me later sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll remember what I was looking for, but... I have this, you know, kind of consistent pattern of going to look for something and I can't, and I just thought of it two seconds ago and I can't remember what it was, you know. Someone said Sometimes that... Sometimes I walk around with a notepad to write these things down <laughs> before they vanish. Someone uh, said recently, or at least I, I ran across a, um, I think a psychiatrist who said this, that the problem uh, with uh, forgetting is if you pass through a door, uh you know, just walking through a door. That's why when you walk into a new room, you can't remember what you went there for because you pass through a doorway and the mind shifts gears when you change doorways. And so it would make sense that same thing with computers. You change a window, you went through a doorway, and so you forget. Well, you know, actually back to the topic, which is uh, the meditation, I sometimes find I just relax and the, and the idea comes back to me or it mm-hmm. comes back to me somewhere else. You know, when it, next to my TV, I've got a little pad of post-its and I'll think of something I'll note it down I won't even worry myself to have to remember it because I'll see the TV program I'll see the annoying advert I'll see this I'll see that and it'll drive it out of my mind and I just let it be and note it down and don't worry about it well you've been practicing for a long time what do you see as a consistent set of issues or problems that people face today that they didn't have 30 years ago What's more common I think now? People are under stress. They're under time stress. They're rushing. They're running. They're having to juggle so many things. And um, not all of those things are equally important. And I think one thing that I find the TM does and the growth of the supermind does is it helps priorities fall into place. That's something that Martin Scorsese mentions. And many people mention, um, I've, I've asked very busy Wall Street uh, business people, traders and others, how do you find the time? And they say, you know, I get more time because not everything is equally important and some things that you think you have to do, you don't actually have to do. So I think stress and time stress are very major things. And what you were alluding to elsewhere, and that's breakdown of real, genuine relationships. Like if you think of the uh, village that you uh, see, probably most see in the um, uh, masterpiece theater Mm -hmm. uh, mysteries where people get killed in the village (laughs) or (laughs) 
Doc Martin in his village, uh, you know, people know each other. They greet each other. There are endless number of real connections and communications every day that create a sense of social fabric, cohesive social fabric. And uh, this is um, missing in my, many of our lives. Yes. Where we, yes, some people telecommute. They're just sitting there by their computer, and they even, don't even have a work uh, set of work friends. So I think these are some of the things I notice. Did, did you grow up in South Africa? I did. I was born and raised 24 years, 26 years, excuse me, then came to the States, mm -hmm. did my medical training there, mm -hmm. and uh, so that was uh, a different world. Well, the reason I, I asked was that, well, I'm, I read that you had studied there, but I didn't know you grew up there, but your accent is still present. And... Uh, yes. I spent some time in Africa, not in South Africa, but in uh, uh, West Africa, and uh, one of the things that I still treasure from that time is the vibrant life of the streets where people were connected. You know, they may not have been rich, but they were rich in society. And uh, I often lament that one. Well, even from my own childhood here in Texas, where there was great life outdoors in in the neighborhoods you know the kids were outside the parents were outside at night and they were all connected and knew each other and uh, where i live now i know who the neighbors are but i don't really know them you know and uh, so it's kind of yeah, sad it, that that connected very very similar here and i think the the sort of disengagement from one's neighbors is unfortunate mm -hmm. i don't know how we fix it it just seems like that's the way things go but uh, what you're arguing in your book is that uh, through transcendental meditation, you can feel less stressed about it all. Well, I'll tell you a story about a neighbor. I, I have this elderly neighbor is in his mid-80s, and, um, you know, he's so nice. I've always seen him working in his garden, big guy, and he's very interesting. He's got a lot of interesting things that he's shown me over the years, and he came to me the other day, was this a couple months back, and he's got advanced cancer, and he says, oh, you know, no. would it make any difference to meditate? Because I'm in pain, I'm in distress, I'm in my mid-80s. Is there any point in learning TM now? I said, absolutely. Linked him up with a TM teacher, and then I followed up, and every time I called him, his wife would answer the phone, I'm sorry, Joe can't come to the phone. He's busy meditating. <laughs> That's <And> wonderful. <laughs> Turn out, he said it's totally changed his outlook, his energy, his mm -hmm. optimism. So there's a good neighbor story, mm -hmm. you know. There still is some neighborliness. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of particularly glad to tell you the story because, um, you know, it's not too late. <laughs> Your friend's instruction didn't work. <laughs> Give the local GM center a shot. <laughs> well, I will. I will. I'll... I'll uh see a, what I can do to be, uh, you know, more fair to the technique. Or do you call it a technique, or what, what do you call it? It is a, it is a technique. Okay. And here I, I'm making a serious offer to you over the radio, mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm okay. committed. Reach out to me. Tell me how it's going. I'll give you my email address. Mm -hmm. What is your... I would love... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You can get it through my website. I don't want to give it out over the air, but okay. I'll definitely give it out to you and my phone number. Reach out to me. I would love to help. Uh, you know, using a 70s term, I'd love to turn you on. <laughs> I'd, love to help, I'd love to help you access these things. And, you know, you're a guy. You're, you're out there in the public. You're talking to people. You know, I asked my patient who was so insistent on my learning, why did you persist? So much in pushing me to learn because if it hadn't been for him there wouldn't be the last two books that I'd written mm. he said you know I just had a feeling that if you could understand how much it could do how many people you could help being in your position having your patients writing your books I just felt that I had to really persist and get you to do it because you could help so many people mm. that way so that's what I'm saying to you well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, st tell us your website. Website's normanrosenthal.com. normanrosenthal.com. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Rosenthal. It's been a delightful conversation, very informative, and I need to uh, probably uh, uh, frame the 11 Secrets of Happiness. I think that's a good thing to have on your wall. Absolutely. Page 196. Go for it. Okay. Thank you, sir. We've been talking with Norman Rosenthal, MD, author of Supermind, How to Boost the Performance and Live a Richer and Happier Life Through Transcendental Meditation. Great book. Pick it up. For Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong signing off. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. <laughs>